Bumpback whales, they're an amazing story in their own right. They can produce songs that span more than nine octaves, more than a piano, including so sounds that reach right down to the lower limit of our hearing and even sounds that extend above the upper limit of human hearing. Humpback whales are just the most phenomenal composers I could ever imagine. Welcome to the Mongabay Newscast. I'm your co-host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you weekly conversations with experts, authors, scientists, and activists working on the front lines of conservation, shining a light on some of the most pressing issues facing our planet and holding people in power to account. This podcast is edited on Gadigal land. Today on the newscast... I speak with John Ryan, a biological oceanographer with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. His team conducted a multi-year study that examined the songs of baleen whale species in the California current ecosystem. The study, Ryan explains, found that whale songs rose and fell along with food supply. In this conversation, Ryan explains to me why this happened and what it tells us about the health of baleen whale species in changing ocean conditions. While providing a window into how some whale species may be more vulnerable than others, particularly with changing foraging conditions for krill, Ryan emphasizes that the science helps inform management and protection of whale species, including providing information for shipping companies to reduce whale strikes and rewarding conservation efforts. Ryan was kind enough to share some of his recordings with us, which provide a haunting glimpse into the world of whales. John, welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mike. So first, can you tell us, tell our audience, what your team discovered using bioacoustics? Can you give us a, a short summary of what it was that you found. We discovered that how much baleen whales sing depends strongly on how well the ecosystem is feeding them. And that's the ecological knowledge that was gained. Yet what this research did was to answer a longstanding question that resource managers have, which is, can we just listen to whales and know how many of them are here? And this research resoundingly answered, no, sorry, <laughs> it's more complicated. So, I mean, we can get, and we're going to get into the complex part about that, but I guess for the average, for the average listener, why is this research so important? Go into a little bit more detail. What is this really telling us about whales? Well, all of our research about whales in this region is about supporting the recovery of populations that were decimated by whaling. We can only do that if we understand where, when, and how they live. And our, our activities intersect with their lives. So in this case, the idea that resource managers need to know local population density, they need to know what, what aspects of the ecosystem influence their lives and their behavior. This very fundamental ecological research gives us a window into their lives. One of many windows that we open ultimately through the application of technologies. And so what are you learning about the changing ocean conditions and how animals, in this case, whales, are adapting to this? I mean, our listeners all hopefully know by now that our oceans, they're heating up. But from what I understand in your report, at the height of a marine heat wave in 2015, whale songs from both blue and humpbacks were at their lowest levels. So can you explain why? Yes, that's right. We began recording nearly a decade ago uh, in the summer of 2015, which was happened to be the peak 
of a major marine heat wave that impacted the entire Northeast Pacific. And from the perspective of a whale, there were really two primary impacts. Food resources were low in abundance, relatively depleted. And also the food web was toxic because the unusual ocean chemistry that accompanied the heat wave contributed to a massive bloom of toxin producing algae. And it is documented as the largest scale of poisoning of marine mammals by this potent neurotoxin called demolic acid uh, ever observed. So they were hard times for, for whales and many other animals, not just marine mammals, but also seabirds who were starving and being poisoned. And so your emphasis on environmental change is, is highly relevant here. In a way, what the marine heat wave gave us was a, an opportunity to view not just an extreme state that can develop in the ecosystem, but also a potential view of the future if these marine heat waves increase in frequency or severity. Hey, thanks for tuning in to listen to the first few minutes of this podcast. There is much more to the conversation, but if you want to hear the full interview, find the Manga Bay Newscast wherever you get your podcasts from and click subscribe. You can also get each new episode straight to your email inbox by subscribing to Manga Bay's weekly newsletter at mangabay.com. And if you really want to support us, you can donate to us at patreon.com forward slash Don't forget to leave a review, and thank you as always for listening.